think about a storm. If there was a storm and every Microsoft customer came in today and said, I want to use Microsoft Dynamics and I want it to be used the way you show it to me in the demo, the world would collapse. We don't have skill sets. Very few know how to build on it. Uh, the way you see it and sold to you is not how it works out of the box. And you run yourself in these situations where there's no direction but in order to figure out another path, right? For security, I think this automation, and I think it solves a lot of what you're talking about and looking, you know, and what we're talking about here around how do you make this stuff more effective? How do you drive costs down? How do you make it more efficient than for the customer? Because at the end of the day, they're scrambling. Jungle. Let's start with some softball questions, Chris. Um, what do you do? Well, <laughs> a lot, I guess. <laughs> so I'm trying to do less, but I'm the CEO and founder of a company called 360 Sock. Um, we're an award-winning managed security company focused primarily around the security operations center. Um, but I like to say that I'm more probably the chief everything officer because I do a lot of different tasks. I support a lot of my teammates. Um, whether it's in the SOC, whether it's day-to-day -day sales, operations, being the bad guy, being the good guy, you know, all of the above kind of coincides with, you know, this, you know, island-based role that all of us CEOs sit on, especially in these fast-growing companies. So, yeah. So when you say a security vendor centered around SOC, like, um, let's, let's expand on that, get into that a little bit. What does, what does that mean? What do you, what services are you offering and what problems are you solving? Yeah, definitely. So we offer primarily Security Operations Center as a service, which in the old days we used to call managed detection and response. Um, so what we encompass is an, you know, kind of a point everything to us type of security approach. And we will take on the all eyes on glass monitoring using a stack of tools to meet what we call or to meet the Gartner SOC triad methodology, which we see being kind of the gold standard for the security operations center. And then everything that coincides with that is involves products, services, you know, audit, compliance, you know, it kind of just sits down below those day-to-day -day activities. We see the operations center probably being the most critical element next to designing the right technologies for each, you know, independent entity or customer more or less. So one of the biggest bifurcations to see in this space right now is, are you running, does a, does a client have to run and integrate with your SIM? Are you managing their SIM? How does, you know, as a company is looking at and saying, okay, we want to go to a SOC as a service and we'll, we'll get back to that in a moment. But what is the, what is the, like the prep work and the deployment work in order to turn you on? Us, we're, we're unique in this space because we really do have two go-to-market strategies within the Security Operations Center. One is being a platform, we call it security platform as a service provider, effectively. Um, that's where you bring all your own technology. We don't care what SIM you bring. We don't care what EDRs and DLPs and you know scanners and everything else within your security stack. You point all of the APIs at our platform, and then our platform will ingest all the alerting. We'll pivot into your platforms when need be, but we'll manage that 24 seven. So that's one option. So you don't have to bring any, uh, you don't have to use any of our technology besides our medium, our GUI. Um, our GUI is effectively a full service security orchestration automation response platform, often referred to as a SOAR. Um, the coolest thing about that is that we do enable live chat within that SOAR GUI. Um, for our customers. Um, so within five minutes, our team, our analysts will be inside any alert working live with a customer 24 seven. So that's one way. And then you also have the other side of the coin where customers don't have a lot of their own technology. Maybe they only have their EDR solution in a firewall and they don't have a SIM and they don't have network detection response. They don't have a data lake. In those situations, then we have our second offering, which is our SOC as a service offering, which then encompasses or brings to the table the SIM. Um, it brings UEBA in a data lake. It has a forensic agent on the endpoint. And then um, in, on top of that network detection response fully managed by our team. What I'm often seeing with that element or that product set is that customers say, cool, man, I, I need you for SIM. I already have Dart Trace, so I'm gonna plug that in. 
and then you know I'll use your forensic agent for collection and then your team manages it etc you know so those are the typical use cases I'm seeing now but yeah we're making us a little more unique we don't our customers don't have to use our tech um, and they also can augment our tech into what they're currently doing if that makes it better too so lots of flexibility lots of integrations um, I want to touch on really the problem that you're solving and I see this in a couple of ways. The first way is um, a company that decides that they want to do and take security operations and do it in house. So, um, you know, we've designate, you know, Johnny is our security person now, and, and they're responsible for maintaining our, our tools and also the investigations. Or, I, in my opinion, I think the ones that are actually even worse are we've engaged a small MSP who now has a security function within that MSP, and they're doing there are security practitioners now. But you know, when you find out and you start talking to them, you know, that MSP is maybe, you know, <clears throat> half a dozen people predominantly doing field support, you know, your desktop and server network infrastructure support that then say, hey, we can do your security as well. So um, I'm sure you've seen a lot more than this on the and, and, you know, of course, coming from the other side, running this professionally. What happens? I mean, so, so what a what drives companies into a professional SOC, SOC as a service? And what would you say to somebody that's currently doing this in house, you know, at a small scale or, or engaged with a small MSP to do this? So, I mean, there are a lot of people offering various security services. Um, there are a lot of people offering 24 seven services. There's a lot of people that offer 24 seven is not really 24 seven. There's a lot of, you know, outsourcing and insourcing going on that people aren't really probably as transparent about in order to meet, you know, what they're needing to meet from a customer requirement. Um, I see that in the smaller MSPs, um, people are just dabbling as security is another service that we're going to offer another product function. Um, for the biggest customers out there that already have built their socks, um, I think there's an opportunity to augment the security operations center. I'm seeing you know, more than ever, those, you know, large Splunk customers, large, you know, Q radar deployments that are coming back to the service provider space, i.e. SOC as a service, somebody like us, and is saying, look, we, we don't necessarily need you to manage it. We've built the team. We've got 30, 40 analysts and managers and everything, but we're running into these situations where our team is extremely fatigued at tier one, tier two, tier three levels. And for those type of customers, they can come to us and actually um, augment our platform and they'll actually use the same functionality that we offer as an MDR SOC as a service. But effectively, instead of our team being the handoff to the management to all the way down to eradication, they handle that piece. We manage the underlying platform, the integrations and build the automation for them. Effectively making their tier one, tier two, tier three approach 99.9% .9 effective out of the box, just like our SOC as a service offering is by using that SOC bot one, two, and three effectively to give your analysts a fully enriched, you know, fully enriched alert, fully enriched um, conversational point so that they can actually take that and then, you know, obviously respond to it. So yeah, two approaches, two different address points, two different, totally different size of customers both have a common use case. It's just one has it built already, the other doesn't. Um, or if they might be thinking they're getting it from somebody that has it built already, more or less, I guess is a good way to say it. So I see this right now uh, with Microsoft. Microsoft's pushing E5 um, with the security functions. And so you could say, oh, okay, we've got now email security and we've got Defender for our desktops and we're going to have Sentinel SIM. And now we're secure because we've got this E5 security piece. And you kind of get into that conversation a little bit and well, who's configuring it and who's managing it and who's alerting it and who's triaging it. And the answer is usually nobody, but, um, <laughs> I, I mean, I kind of wonder what this is going to mean for the landscape of, of, uh, you know, like of enterprises that deploy this stuff and then, you know, turn it on. And then, I, I mean, I got to imagine you get a lot of phone calls, like we've turned this on and now we don't know what to do with it. It's more the, the turned it on. It's got a lot of noise. We need to figure out if we need to turn that off. Like, you know, who's going to who's going to look at that? You know, that's the most common thing I hear probably out there is, you know, the technologies are really noisy. They all work good, but somebody's got to be there to sift through the noise. Um, I think that when you look at 
cybersecurity as a whole and you look at kind of where the direction of the space is going, I think the space recognizes that this problem exists, right? Um, you know, and, and the problem does exist with a solution in mind that really does focus around automation. I mean, most of what we're doing in the security operations center at a human basis can be solved with higher accuracy leveraging automation. So if you start looking at the future of what that security operations center looks like and what, what people need to do from a program standpoint, they're going to have to do, use more automation because it drives costs down, right? And if you drive costs down, you can have more. If cost is higher and the, and the service providers you're buying from, the software providers you're buying from aren't leveraging these type of technologies, they're also working behind the eight ball too as well, always playing catch up. So I think, you know, security of the future and kind of where these companies all go, large, small, is really they have to adopt automation. Now, that creates another problem. We just went from 3.5 million, you know, skilled gapped individuals with open jobs in the space they claim. You add in automation to that conversation. We don't have enough professionals that understand security automation in order to hit the objectives that the corporate ecosystem is going to require. And if you look at it from that way, think about a storm. If there was a storm and every Microsoft customer came in today and said, I want to use Microsoft Dynamics and I want it to be used the way you show it to me in the demo, the world would collapse. We don't have skill sets. Very few know how to build on it. Uh, the way you see it and sold to you is not how it works out of the box. And you run yourself in these situations where there's no direction but in order to figure out another path, right? For security, I think this automation, and I think it solves a lot of what you're talking about and looking, you know, and what we're talking about here around how do you make this stuff more effective? How do you drive costs down? How do you make it more efficient than for the customer? Because at the end of the day, they're scrambling. Large customer with the sock is scrambling because his employees are closing alerts that they just don't feel like triaging and they know nobody's going to come look at it. And, you know, the alert's been the same way forever. So what makes you think it's any different today? You know, or I'm leaving early or whatever it might be. You start looking at this and there's one keyword that solves all of this and it's automation. And I think that's going to be huge. Sorry, I ran on on that one a little no. bit. I'm a passionate automation guy because I think the lead the, the your number one asset in the security auto, in the security operation center is your automation and you know you can't automate if you don't orchestrate and you can't you know extend response where it's manageable for thousands or tens of thousands without it and leveraging apis and that kind of stuff so that's kind of where i where i think that space goes more or less or how you can try to solve it at least at a forefront, any customer size. I have a client and they make desalination plants. And and one of their projects is in Nigeria. So when you look at that and all of a sudden you say, okay, your phone system vendor, your phone system vendor starts seeing phone calls and traffic that's going to Nigeria and blocks it because all phone calls to Nigeria are just automatically there's something wrong with it. Scam, right. But, but this client actually has desalination plant projects where they're installing desalination plants in Nigeria and they're trying to convince the phone system company now that they actually need to be able to call Nigeria legitimately because like they're actually doing business in Nigeria. Right. <laughs> and it was a really kind of funny thing because you know that 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 phone provider wasn't equipped to actually even compute and understand that like people actually do business in Nigeria. Um and I think about this a lot in the security world too because you, you know a you've got um a lot of data coming into systems but really what I, like I'm more interested in is what is normal and what is abnormal. Like if you're doing business in Nigeria, it's normal for you to be sending data back and forth to Nigeria, mm -hmm. right? But like if you're not doing business in Nigeria and like these sorts of decisions become very personalized, but require a, a certain amount of behavioral anal you know, anal and behavioral analytics up front in order to say, you know, it's, it's normal that we have data that goes to China. It's normal that we have data to go to Nigeria. And, you know, I'm, I'm wondering, like, how do you guys deal with this with your clients of actually coming out and saying, you know, I mean, it's really kind of twofold, right? The first half of it is how do you, 
you know, aggregate at scale to say, you know, we've seen this thing now happen that's happening across a lot of, and there's something going on here. And at the same time, pull that noise out to say, no, it's totally normal for this company to be doing this sort of traffic because that's just what they do. Mm. So one onboarding, it all comes down to the onboarding process of understanding what your current, you know, your current customer that you're working on ecosystem looks like, right. Or tech, you know, network footprint looks like, um, you know, and also understanding what is normal inside of those, you know, you know, regions that might be more susceptible to scam and, you know, malicious activity, such as, you know, the top, whatever tent it is that most of us know off the top of our hands. Right. You know, and it happens that, you know, these companies, there are these countries like Nigeria or even Cuba, or there's a few other ones that, you know, north side of India, there's some significant areas where scam is relevant, right. Or prevalent. And, you know, what happens with the telco and the telco defense is, he definitely leans towards, I don't want to get burned for, you know, X amount of dollars by allowing this to go through, knowing that customer, if this isn't legit, customer's not going to want to pay for that. I, I think, though, it just goes back to the start of that is you solve this in onboarding, understanding where the customer has locations, understanding what's normal. You know, educating them that, you know, they can probably use Wi-Fi calling in a lot of those locations too, if they need to keep it on their U.S. network versus, you know, possibly, you know, having to use a local telco, you know, and, and keep it all SIP over, you know, I guess public internet at that point using an app on a phone or something. But, you know, when you're looking at from a telco perspective, if they're delivering any type of last mile service to that customer, I would assume they would want to know what kind of business they're in or what they're doing or, you know, what normal business hours looks like, especially if they plan on blocking communication between the States and Nigeria or something that could impact the safety of an individual. Right. You know, and I think that's the presentation. I think customers look at it as this makes my business hard. Well, you know, Toko's like, well, this makes my business hard too to manage your Nigeria traffic if I didn't am not aware of it. Right. You got to look at it from both coins. But, you know, how it can be solved is, is just, you know, having the right, you know, procedures, having the right processes when you go through these conversations to understand what the normal is for that customer and then setting parameters around what's abnormal. Because, you know, at the end of the day, if you break, make it around safety, you get what you want. If you push it as a business process, you probably don't get what you want. But safety, everybody says, whoa, we can't have malicious people grab an IV, you know, and, you know, things in hospitals, that's safety problem. We got to solve that, you know, but if you go, Hey man, you know, I think you need this because of, you know, X, Y, Z. They're like, you know what? That sounds like an item we need to budget for next year. And you're like, wait a minute here. That's the wrong approach. Go back to it. Th there's a safety problem here and we need to solve that. And then with a telco and, a vo and voice services, it's a major thing. Right. They have to be able to communicate, you know, if somebody falls, hurts themselves, gets attacked, you know, and, and if the carrier is blocking those calls, they're putting those employees at risk. So, you know, in those scenarios, I, I just think that, you know, if people do their due diligence and on that first, you know, 30 days of the new customer or in the scoping, you avoid that. If, if it's not that case, then you have to fight blocks and everything. And it's no different. Telecom versus security tool. All of our security tools that we want to load get blocked by the next tool. So you still got to go through all these processes. And if you know it in advance, possibly you might be able to get a whitelist or an exclusion made, right? Helping solve the problem before it's a problem. So, um, yeah, that's kind of how I, I, I really look at every process breakdown, every, every customer failure when it comes to that piece of it being around, you know, something was missed in onboarding, right? You know, it's just the same way it goes if you flip the coin to the service provider and you say, look, we're like, how in the world did this customer spend this much money on us when we're on a flat rate and all that? And you're like, well, somebody obviously dropped the ball in the onboarding phase. They didn't ask enough questions or didn't do enough discovery. That's how we got here. We didn't get here because customer day one of signing the contract says, oh, by the way, we just got this new vendor. Let's, let's just slam them with traffic right now and, you know, we'll test them. It's not, that's not a normal behavior. You, you, um, tools have come up a few times and it's, um, I mean, there's, it's like, it's like every day there's a new tool that gets announced, like, oh, solve all your security problems by implementing this tool, right? So now we have some tools that become, that I feel like are, are pretty much like ubiquitous in the stack, right? We talk about EDR as a tool that'll probably stay here forever. And we talk about, you know, SIM, right? You know, these are like foundational tools. 
Um, for companies that are just that are either selling tools, but actually, let's say from a from a company that's looking to solve security problems, and 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 it's just like tool, 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 or as a service, as a service, as oh, you know, you can you can get this MDR, you can get this XDR, you can get this SOC, you can get this EDR, you can get this SWG, like you know, how do you unpack this noise and figure out what actually? makes sense to do like what, what you know people are trying to figure this out like what, what did, how do you how do you help them got to understand what you're securing i mean and i think most sales people just forget that right out of the bat or right out the gate they forget they go to that bat and they forgot the whole po process of got to understand one about the customer and you got to understand what you're going to solve for the customer effectively what their risk is right some customers don't have that much overall risk out of the gate. You know, they don't not HIPAA compliant. They're not PCI. They, you know, do an EDI transfer of funds and, you know, work through an ERP and ship a, you know, a metal weight or something like that, you know, along those lines or, you know, they package hay and ship it across seas. You know, you start looking at, you know, certain arenas where maybe compliance isn't as rich or maybe only compliance is rich in certain things like a custom, but not in a system, you know, and, and in those arenas, I think that the security vendors out there and also the salespeople, they miss the, they miss the boat on just trying to figure out what are we solving? Not, you know, everyone has the common problems, right? Fishing, um, you know, data theft or you know you know misuse of data things like that everyone has those hygiene problems and the phishing side being more malicious but not everyone has the opposite problems on their on their you know main screen let's put it a lot of them are on the back seat which is that right obviously a security professional i'm like no i mean we should you really need to spend all the money on security but that's not realistic right and i always i always like to have these conversations around with customers around this and it's if i make a million dollars a year on a solution and that million dollars it costs me nine hundred thousand dollars to secure it what do i do buy insurance right buy insurance you know i do what i have to do but i buy insurance because i'm not going to take a million dollars in profit as a manufacturer and shrink that to a hundred thousand when 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 the organizational's tolerance for risk is not what the same as what I would think it would be as a security professional, right? So they have to take their accepted risk and say, look, we'll accept, you know, to put a hundred thousand dollars of the, you know, million every quarter in a ransomware fund until we've accumulated enough, hoping we don't get hit there, and then we've got a fund because we'd rather capture the revenue. This is what the process must be going in all these boardrooms because it's not the opposite of, all right, guys, we've got all this money. Let's go buy all this technology. No, they're looking at it as, look, if, if, if I make a million on this feature or function, this app in the cloud, and it costs me $900,000 to secure it, I got two choices. Accept the risk or kill the app, right? Making 100000 on the app when I was making you know 90% more than that doesn't make business sense. And that's why companies are in these situations because somebody somewhere has got to make the decision. If it costs us 500,000 or 400,000 to secure that million, maybe, maybe that does make sense. So let's ramp up and let's get the products and services that mitigate the risk. So I think that these need to be the conversations that you know customers need to have when they're going in and trying to figure out what do I buy, right? Now, 2023 is a lot different than 2014, 15, when I first started doing this and first started the company. Um, you know, we're coming up on our 10 year anniversary here soon and it's totally approached in the same manner, but differently. You know, now you can go out and buy at a per employee cost or a per endpoint cost. You can literally buy layers of security. Back in 15 and 14, when we first went at this, you couldn't do that. You could, but you couldn't, right? There wasn't a, you know, menus of items and programs at every service provider. It was like there was a one or two, you know, and, and those were your choices besides the OEM and you go through that process. But I think now customers have to look at it as if they're looking at this as a cost factor, a rate center, and they look at this down from mitigating risk down to a rate center, 
if they're already paying an employee cost of $150 and that $150 is, you know, ADP and it's, you know, I mean, it's probably more than that. You start looking at insurance, you start looking at all these costs, cyber at 10 to $15 per employer endpoint all of a sudden looks like a huge win. We're talking one to 5% of the overall employee cost is what, what you need really to secure up. But so, that's so, not the case for most entities, right? They don't look at it that way. Insurance historically pays you after an event happens, right? You know, uh, somebody breaks into your house and steals all your stuff, you get insurance. Your house burns down, you get insurance to replace it. And and I, I thought about, you know, cyber and, and that lens for a long time. But the problem is, is that cyber cybersecurity isn't is an insurance policy, right? You're, you're deploying layers of cybersecurity to lower your risk of something bad happening to you, but not necessarily like a guarantee. There, I mean, there, what is the ROI on spending a million dollars a year in, in cybersecurity? Like, you, you know, can you quantify a decrease in, in effective risk for a company and therefore, you know, what their, what their budget overhang or what their revenue risk overhang or, you know, I, you know how, do you, how do you have that conversation with an enterprise that says, you know, at a million dollars a year, you know, it's reasonable for you to spend a hundred thousand dollars because it's giving you this return, you know, on your investment. Um, so, well, there's definitely tools out there that can help come co customers in these conversations. Um, I believe risk lens or something like, uh, along those lines, that product suite actually can take like your current frameworks, the products you have in your environment, your accepted risk, revenue, and everything, and kind of spit you out a, a score. Based on that score, um, you could actually plug in a new technology and say, okay, if I add in a new firewall and it has these functions, what is it? How does it change my risk profile? You know, or if I add a you know data classification solution, how does it change my profile? Um, there's technology out there that will do that. Now, are you going to see that in the everyday company? Absolutely not. It's expensive. Um, and there's still four, three or four elements that go into that conversation that the IT gentleman or woman that's running that department, they don't have the skill set a lot of times to even be able to plug this sh the data into the to the solution to be able to give them the output. So, you know, there is a way to solve it with software, but at the end of the day, you know, I think you have to start looking at you know, the historical or the footprint of the customer and say, look, if, you know, if you're not using MFA, you, I, I always look at, I guess another way to look at this is there's always low hanging fruit that you can give for improvements, whether it's, you know, just go back and check to make sure you do have MFA enabled. I, or, I mean, the easiest, simplest thing to turn on that gives you the most value. It's like if you're not, most people MFA, don't use it. It's crazy. It's crazy. It solves, it solves so many problems and costs you almost nothing to deploy. I mean, it's definitely, um, I was talking with a business owner here and recently, and he was explaining how he got fished. So this is a, this is a, this is a, <laughs> they're an MSP. I mean, they install, uh, you know, their, their primary business is installing like wireless and AV systems. I mean, not like an unsavvy, you know, person, right. Very savvy person. He was personally fished for over a hundred thousand dollars. And in the process of going through that, he found out that, um, their cyber insurance policy did not include a you know crime um, riders like so he had there were two specific riders that the insurance company came back and was like oh whoops sorry nope you're not covered because you didn't have crime and I forget the other rider specifically that he didn't have they helped with the investigation they figured out what had happened they did the whole thing the bank didn't help at all either with the wire transfer that went out and you know his reaction to it is like well in the grand scheme of things like I learned a lesson for this much money and it wasn't that much money and I'll recoup this money in this many you know this many quarters so he wasn't like distraught over it but insurance is also an evolving you know moving target and and this reliance on saying just go out and get insurance is changing insurance companies are getting out of certain policy coverages um i think it was lloyds of london announced that they weren't going to um uh pay ransomware for state-sponsored hacking anymore you know the, the the liability to them were just too high so you know, I, I mean, are you seeing this as well? I mean, insurance companies starting to push back harder and harder against companies of like, oh, nope, sorry, you didn't, you weren't running an EDR, or you weren't running a fill in the blank, or you didn't pay attention to alert Y on, on, on the second of of March, and therefore your insurance is doesn't, you know, we're not, we're not going to pay you. The day of insurance in cybersecurity has a finish line. <laughs> I mean, that's just probably the best way to put it. I mean, I sure. 
companies will always be able to get insurance, but you can already see 100% that they're not covering state-sponsored attacks. Um, that was Lloyd's who did release that. I saw that as well. You also see on your Lloyd's policy, if you're a customer of theirs, they also <laughs> real clearly state this on there. I was actually just looking at a renewal. And uh, it's, it's really clearly. So my caveat to that always is, at what point did it all come from the state-sponsored pe- folks then, right? And, and that's where I think the insurance loophole possibly down the road comes into play again. They're just going to be like, well, it's not, yeah, this gang didn't do it. This group didn't do it, but they're funded and owned by XYZ. So yeah. does that mean that they're state sponsored? I mean, I think there's too many loopholes in the insurance game. Insurance is going to continually to recoup their money and not pay out. They all pretty much across the board now bring in their own people, breach coaches, to come in and walk people through their effectiveness at, you know, actually exfiltrating or root cause is not not what it used to be. This isn't like, you know, the the old days of bringing in Mandiant and you know and and Mandiant coming in and you know cleaning the cleaning cleaning the park up, right? You know, when they're done, they even rake the sand, and you know it's great. You know, now it's well, we're going to come in, we're going to figure out if there's exposure, and then at that point, we're going to figure out if we're going to pay for that exposure. We're going to tell you to accept the risk. That's what I think I'm seeing more of than the opposite, which means that the day insurance, the end of insurance is coming. Meaning, when it comes to cyber insurance, of you know, you can just call them up and say, "I got locked out, I have bad hygiene, and you know, come cover me for my own mistake." I think those are over. They're getting insurance for the everyday business, I think, is extremely hard for cyber now. I mean, the questions or, you know, the temp, the questionnaires, the process, the re-asking of questions 100 times over, it's it's rigorous, you know, and I think companies are just going to pass on it and say, look, I mean, you know, if this happens, I'm going to have a backup of it or whatever it is. And, you know, I got to start looking at other options because... The cost of having insurance is probably more than just having somebody monitor it. The chances, the monitoring is probably more effective than the insurance. So you know, there's a lot of different ways to look at this. But yeah, so I think insurance comes to an end eventually when it comes to the coverage. You would talk about really risk um, for companies and cyber policies. And, and, the, and the two buckets that you really kind of established were, you know, do you have a compliance risk? So are you PCI or HIPAA or, you know... I mean, there's there's a lot of other acronyms, right? You know, uh, I deal with ITAR companies a lot, right? Are you you know, do you have these overwhelming, you know, do you have a compliance mandate that you have to adhere to? And then you had like everybody else, but you know, there's still risk in this everybody else category. You have cash in a bank account, you've got employees working for you, you have productivity. I mean, if you're barrel, if you're if you're you know growing hay and you have to bail it and then put it on a boat and ship it somewhere, if you can't do that, like that's still relatively impactful to your business or catastrophic for your business. So, you know, how, how does a company, you know, I don't want to say like figure out their risk profile, but figure out like, like, you know, what's an acceptable like scale, you know, if you're a million dollar year business, you know, what should you be spending on cyber? I mean, if you're a, if you're a hundred million dollar year business, what should you be spending on cyber? You know, those, those scales probably go up or down percentage wise, but like, how, how do you, how do you, I mean, it's like, you know, you read these things of like HBR of like, oh, you should be spending 20% of your revenue on marketing, right? Have we gotten to that point with cyber yet where there's just like a, this is the industry benchmark that you should be looking at? Sure. It would be nice if there was a lot more standardized, you know, you know, besides like every other framework, it's just like you need to do this. It's all interpretation based. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't know if it'll necessarily be like that, I guess. I think it's more that companies are going to have to determine again from a percentage of what what's the impact now let's break this down further because the question is very broad right in my opinion let's say all right 15 to 20 percent sounds good your total it spends probably 30 35 percent all all perfect world um i don't think that's the exact realistic right i think what it is is you know, in the marketing piece, right? And I don't know, Mar- you know, also marketing is telling us that marketing should be, too. So, you know, so there's, there's that component as well. Um, I, I would say that, you know, somewhere 10 to 15% of your overall spend should be focused around making sure that, you know, your, your assets are protected and that's protecting your, your assets or your physical assets, your employees, you know, everything that's coinciding your customers, right? 
um, and having a best practice around that. Um, so if you're a million dollar company that makes a million dollars a year, I don't think that a hundred thousand dollars to secure your business is, is asking for too much. I think that's probably about a good safe bet. And I bet that same company spends another hundred thousand on it services. And if they're in data centers and that, that's probably another hundred thousand, you know, most companies don't make a hundred percent margin. So I think we all know that, you know, out of every top end dollar we bring in, there is a food, is it like a fiduciary responsibility if you're in financial services, uh, or you know an owner's responsibility or an executive's responsibility um, to make sure that the best practices are in place. Right? I think historically, though, a lot of executives have said we got insurance and we'll let them worry about it if it happens. Um, I think that that day's ended now <laughs> significantly because it's just um, they the insurance companies can't play it play that path. Um, but I think ten to fifteen percent is a good safe number. I would love to see twenty percent. Um, and if you actually broke that out and you said twenty percent is you know cyber twenty you know twenty percent IT and say cyber and compliance, you know mm -hmm. it's tough to throw cyber in its own bucket. Because there's several parts of cyber, right? There's the security element of it, then there's the compliance element of it, and then there's the regulatory bodies that, you know, on top of the compliance, and then on the other side, you have the product. So, so it's a pretty big space. That's even like with jobs, right? You see people like, I want to get break into cybersecurity. Well, no one ever says like, hey, but, you know, break in as go sell it. They're all, I'll be an engineer, man. <laughs> well, yeah, well, I'm sure, right? Nobody wants to do the hard stuff, like go out there and talk to the people about it, use the skill set. So, um, yeah, I think ten. I think to answer your question accurately, somewhere between ten and twenty percent, I think is a fair bet. I think the average company right now only spends like three to five, though. I had a conversation with a, a director of security operations, a SecOps for a, a large company, and the conversation was fascinating because there were, I mean, I, there was a bunch of backstory with this one, but basically that the net net was. Um, he, a certain percentage of his job, his salary, he knew was to be a fall person. Like at some point, something bad would happen that he wasn't able to defend for because he didn't have the budget to defend against it. And that part of his job was to be the one to be fired, right? Like, oh, we had this thing. And like, you're the, you're the person that gets put on the, you know, your, your, your head's on the stake outside. And, and that kind of pushed farther into, you know, I was asking him, uh, if you're working for a company that doesn't really support what you're trying to do because you can't get the budget to actually implement meaningful pro you know um, practices like why not go back to um you know and and a security you know an msp a, a company doing this at scale somebody in the security ecosystem that actually is 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 paid to do this and and his response was something along the lines of like if you're an operations of the security company your job is worse than if you're the figurehead that's going to get staked on the fence you know, working for a company that doesn't care because the, the security company is a sales and marketing organization just happens to be selling security. And if you're in operations, you're just the widget that's getting like churned out. And it was like the, the whole conversation got very depressing. Like what, what's the like, there's like no, there's no like flowers of beds of roses out there somewhere. This thing, you just have to go find greener pasture somewhere. I talk to a lot of people that are in positions where they say we have no money, whatever. I don't know. Do they really have no money or do they just not want to ask? So, okay. That's a good segue. You know, no, no, I, I like the segue. Let me let me ask you a segue. What are they supposed to ask for, right? So let me let me let me let me pack this up. We'll talk about tools for a second, right? And we'll talk about tools and we'll talk about processes. So security is the land of endless acronyms. I mean, it, it's like you know the only the only the only I mean only the military I think has more acronyms than security at this point in terms of like your day to day stuff, right? Right. Okay. So, but like, what what what's common, right? We so we talked about um, the easy stuff. The easy stuff is you can go and implement, you know, basic SSO and skim and two factor authentication or MFA, you know, just with whatever. Uh, if you're on Office 365, you can go turn it on. If you're on Google Workspace, you can go just turn it on. Just just go turn it on. Okay. That's my my. I'm going to rant about that for a second. Get off the soapbox. But from there, you know, commonly you have an EDR, you have SIM, you have MVS and vulnerability scanning. You maybe have pen testing. You've got um, network taps. Now you've got this idea of um, secure web gateways, you know, which could be like an anti-malware, an IPS system. Um, Gartner was so good and, and merged all this stuff together into the SASE soup. So now in the SASE soup, we talk about SD-WAN, 
with <laughs> yeah the sassy suit i mean gartner uh, my favorite article i've read i can I, I need to frame this thing it's so fantastic you know gartner defined sse secure service age and then defined sassy and then has a, a post like a year later trying to explain the difference between sse and sassy that they define and they can like if you read the two of them you're like i don't even know if you guys know what the difference is between these two things anyways so we've got the sassy suit now which then also, you know, we start bringing in, you know, a CASB function, DLP function, zero trust networking, so ZTNA function. And you've got like, you look at this and you're like, okay, great. And then you still have to go out and figure out threat intelligence. You've got to go get your threat feeds. You've got to feed this into a SIM. You need to correlate this into something. You have to do incident response. You need to have a SOC. Where do you start? And like, if I, if I came to you and I said, hey, Chris, you know, we've got enough budget here to to do something, but we can't do all of it. Like... Like we could do an EDR or we could do a secure web gateway. Should we do the EDR or should we do the secure web gateway? And oh, by the way, you know, 60% of our workforce is remote. So is it better to be, you know, I perceive EDR as more like defensive and reactionary. Do we want to be defensive or do we want to be offensive a little bit and having filtering? Like how, 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 like this, this I think becomes the question because like, Obviously, we want everything, but you can't get everything. So, like, what actually brings value to this, and in what like order? Ordering is like, I mean, every everybody's their own, right? And what do they have already when you get there? But, um, I mean, to answer the first question, gateway or EDR? I think you got to go EDR because um, the the functionality is going to, you know, it'll have a lot more functionality. You know, the use cases around the gateways, you know, the old DNS, open DNSs, umbrellas, all that kind of stuff, you know, is a, is a very unit based um, security approach, right? In, out, we, we do this, we either block it or it's allowed through, right? The next gen EDRs, they have, you know, a combination of like signature base plus machine learning plus behavioral, you know, plus capabilities to automate response and all that. So you're going to get a lot more value. Um, cost, I think they're about parallel in cost nowadays, though. I mean, you know, I think it's three to four dollars on one side and three to twelve dollars on the other side, you know, depending on features and function. Um, there are some vendors that do combine the two together. Um, and if you're tight on a budget, you really need to find things that'll orchestrate, right? Having a, a lot of technology that's um, singular unit-based technology that doesn't integrate, it's bringing you much value. You know, having technology that orchestrates brings you value, plus it augments your time. So, you know, I think these entities have to look at it from that aspect and go find it. So, you know, the, the best decision would be to have them both. The, if I only had to pick, I'd just take the EDR knowing that I get a lot of functionality and a lot of device control with one product. So then you get into the next question, which becomes integration, which you brought up, orchestration, and, um, you know, like single vendor versus best of breed. And and I'll, I'll, I'll lay some foundation. I'll, I'll use my, you know, I'm not going to put you in a corner here, so that way you can just react to this. Um, Palo Alto, probably the biggest name in, in firewalls, you know, now has acquired a, you know, an SD WAN with, with Cloudgenix. So we have Ion, and then they've got the remote access Prisma, and then they've started integrating a bunch of things into the Prisma sphere, but they don't sell switches and they don't sell access points. So, right. So now do you go out and you have Palo firewalls plus some other manufacturer for switches and access points for your on-premise stuff that you still need to have insight and telemetry for what do you do about east-west traffic oh you pen to your firewall or you go to fortinet you say well fortinet's got the firewall and they've got fortiguard and they've got their sassy product and they have basic sd-wan functionality um and they've got switches and access points you know verdicts out whether those switches and access points are good or not but they've also got now an edr and they've got a sim so like as an enterprise you just go and get with a single vendor or you look at cisco cisco buys meraki meraki has, has Terrible SD WAN functionality it isn't like it doesn't have any. It'll just say, "Oh, the link finally went, you know went down. It was off for however long. We're gonna fail over." Um, that's not a sassy product, right? You still need a piece SD WAN on the outside of that. They bought Open DNS. You know, they bought Umbrella. Um, you know, DNS based filtering. Now they're introducing Casby and Deal, but those don't integrate with each other. You're in two different consoles. You can enable Umbrella within your Meraki console, but you still need to man. I mean, it's like those aren't integrated. Um, what else do we see? So it's like, no matter what you do, you know, EDRs, right? Here are the big ones today. Uh, CrowdStrike, um, a Sentinel one, you know, carbon black is still out there. Of course, Microsoft defender is going to be a huge EDR. Um, you know, those 
you know, th that entire list doesn't integrate with that other security apparatus. You've got two consoles there, you know, then what SIM are you running? Right. Like, so this is, this is part of that. Like, how do you, you know, like, let's just just say you've got a best case scenario. You're, you've got funding, you know, you're, you're bootstrapping a 200 person organization, 500 person organization, and you've got like the, the ability to start from scratch. Like, like, does it make sense to go out and get Palo plus Cortex or Fortinet plus Forti EDR or, you know, Meraki plus Umbrella plus, you know, Sentinel One? Like, help me navigate this world, you know, like you're like. So good question. So I guess the, let's just take it down and kind of dumb it down first. Do you, you know, and look at it in like a real world scenario, right? If If you were going to go buy a specialized bicycle, right? And that specialized bicycle you want to use for road racing. You don't go to Walmart to buy your road racing bike, right? You probably don't go to Amazon to buy your road racing bike. Cisco and Fortinet and companies that have fabric ecosystem development, meaning they bought a bunch of different companies, they plug them all in, effectively are the Walmarts and the Amazons. That doesn't mean necessarily, though, that Walmart doesn't deliver you the, you know, highest grade truffle, you know, in their food section that you can still get at, you know, the Ritz Carlton, the same dang thing. That doesn't mean that they don't do that. It just means that they offer a wide menu of everything. You can come shop here and when you're done, you can leave with a security program. You know, for example, I'll use an example using Fortinet. Fortisor was through acquisition from CyberSpons. Um, we're a Fortisor customer and we have been for six years. And, you know, we, are, we consider ourselves a leader in SOC automation. And Fortisor is one of the top three or four um, SOAR platforms out there in the market. Um, they're a leader in that space. But in switching, they might not be considered a leader considered to, next to like a Cisco or a Juniper, right? They have a, a solution that meets the needs. It integrates into firewall and it does all those things. When you're looking at it from the Palo model, this is like going now and going to buy your specialized bicycle from the, you know, REI, right? And when you go into REI, they've got, you know, a $10,000 road bike and they've got a $1,000 road bike, right? And depending on what you want on your road bike, it gets to $10,000. That's the Palo model. You come to us, you know, because historically we've been the best of breed for firewalls, right? And that's really where it starts. And then they branch into the other products. And now they're trying to buy through acquisition. They're trying to get other companies. They purchased a Misto. Um, which is now um, their uh, SOAR XD or whatever they call it, XSOAR, um, you know, and, you know, companies like uh, Splunk bought um, Phantom, you know, another product. And, you know, you look at companies like a Splunk is like a Palo Alto, very specialized, right? You go there because you want the road bike because you're going to be in the Tour de France. You don't go to buy the road bike for Tour de France at Walmart, Right. So those are the things that you have to justify and the best way to kind of describe the difference between somebody who has, you know, a product for everything you need versus a specialized product, right? I'm sure CrowdStrike or somebody like that who's got billions upon billions of dollars, if they want to be in the switching game, could get into switching and routing and all of that. But, you know, they don't want to be that, from my opinion. They want to be the best at what they can be in their individualized product. Fortinets and the Cisco's of the world necessarily don't have that model. They want best of breed products that are sold to the masses because they want you to look at a menu and buy an EA contract from them. When you buy an EA, it comes with all these different things. And then it's just your responsibility to buy the hardware, right? Because it's all licensing based at that point, right? And they're giving you, you know, those products and services and they always throw in everything because again, they're like Walmart, right? Come over here and when you come buy your, you know, your frozen pizza, you know, we'll, we'll throw in a bag of chips too. And if you need a, you know, a, a package of socks for next week, you can grab that too, right? 
Just like why Cisco sells adapters and cables and like affording and all of that. It's a very similar model. So that's how I look at it. You know, if I need the most granular solution in my, in my scenario, I'm going to invest a lot of time in going to figure out what that is. And that might be Palo or that could be a checkpoint or something else we didn't mention. But if I'm looking to go solve a problem and I already have a relationship, I probably go to Fortinet and Cisco first because I know that they have a menu. And the menu probably includes what I'm looking for, at least to give me the knowledge and understand, can they check the box or do I need to go to the specialist because you know I'm Tiger Woods and I need knee surgery? Checkpoint's an interesting example in that. You know, great lineage of firewalls. I mean, if you're in Europe, you look at Checkpoint a lot different than if you're in the US. You know, they just don't have the penetration in the US. Um, Checkpoint has um, Harmony, which they sell. And and my supposition is that Harmony is licensed very friendly for MSPs that have existing SD-WAN plays because now we see Harmony as the, you know, security solution, you know, that that's bundled with all these other MSPs selling SD-WAN services that was just like, we need to go out and have a SASE solution. What do we do? Oh, great. You know, check. It's just like all of a sudden Harmony, 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 Harmony. And you're like, well, why are you using Harmony? Oh, it's probably licensed really well for you, right? And not competitive. Um, and these sorts of things are very interesting when you kind of like try to look at, you know, assembling all these Legos together. Um, so uh, security, the other question, you know, that I've, I've talked about for many years with security is, you know, it's like this, how do you sell security to somebody who's not buying security, right? It's like, it's an important thing for you to have, but not necessarily something that people invest money in. And... Um, my perception of this really is security for the most part is a, is a defensive purchase or a reactionary purchase. It's either reactionary to a compliance mandate or a supply chain mandate or a client mandate. You know, you can't do business with us. We're not going to give you money until you have X, Y, Z implemented, right? Or it's a reactionary and they're like, we've had something bad happen to us. Um, I thought insurance was going to be the driver to push security forward in companies. And I really haven't seen that yet. Um, and we talked about this a little bit on a golf cart, a golf course a while back of like, what, what do you think becomes the, like, everybody just has a base level of security? Like, 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 when do we get to the point, like what drives it so that every company just has MFA? Like you just like, everybody just knows that you just turn on MFA and you just have MFA running. We don't because there's always going to be the accounts. You can't have those type of features and functions on, right? Yeah. The service counts and stuff. So you know, obviously you're as good as your passwords, you know, protection policy and your password rotation policies at that point, because not everybody's going to be able to mitigate it all the way around. Sure. And I think, do I agree with out of the box by default, every product organically should enable MFA as a default and force an administrator to go in and disable it and write an exclusion? Absolutely. We're not there yet, right? Most companies yeah. can't even, you know, manage change management, yeah. let alone ask them to go <laughs> and do it another way. So I think that's the, I think, I think you're spot on on the, you know, the question. I just think that the companies, you know, it's, they need more help than they want to admit, you know, and because of that, the only, the first thing to do is, well, we'll help you in all the products that everyone sells. And organically all the products are designed to be able to turn off these functions so that they're not an annoyance for the use case that you know ultimately is controlling the environment something like you know service counts right so that's an the, interesting one the part of this that makes me just really you know like how far behind we are amazon last year finally supported redundant hardware keys for root accounts on aws like and you think about this as like they this is AWS like AWS just last year finally supports having hardware keys for security with you know with, with with the ability to have a second key register for redundancy like why do you want to have two keys well that way you, in case you lose your keys you have a second key and you can authenticate against the root account right and like and and you think about that of like if if AWS doesn't support this like what chance does the rest of the world like what, like really what chance do we have like we have no chance it feels like it's depressing anyways um I won't harp on this one too much. Um, did you read? Actually, that's a good question. Did you read the Circle CI blog post from their CTO after their um, their their exploit? Have you gotten into this at all? Mm, I haven't gotten into that one now. Um, we should wrap about this later. Uh, they 
they send me the article. And oh, it's on. it's it's um, I I've still been like digesting this because I have a lot of clients that were impacted by it and have spent weeks now trying to rotate all their keys and update their security accounts and do what they need to do in response to this. Um, basically, the summary is: a Circle CI is a, is a continuous integration, continuous delivery, a CI/CD tool, and companies use them to do uh, you know unit testing, automation, and then um, deployment into production systems. Right, so mm. like it's it's relatively important it's if you're building software everything. and yeah, publishing yeah. software, right? Um, in December of last year, they got a notification from one of their clients that, that they were seeing unusual activity on their accounts and that they had correlated that unusual activity in the service accounts back to stuff that was published and they knew, like they were pretty sure it came from CircleCI. So CircleCI found out about this, not because they detected it, but because one of their clients told them that they had to get their house in order. And they didn't disclose this to the broader community or broader client base for for several weeks and they you know, and then they pub they published this this blog post recently, which was like, "What happened? What are what are like root cause analysis?" And it was really funny. They used some very interesting terminology. Like the ultimate the ultimate hack was we were able to um, um, forge um, uh, session tokens in order to authenticate into platforms, right? But then you go backwards until like what led into that. It was like, well, they didn't say what the threat or the initial exploit was, but it was probably an email phishing attack, right? Because a it was a developer got malicious software on their device, which then did X, Y, and Z. And our and our and then the other one that was really stood out was our antivirus didn't detect it. And I'm like, that that phrasing was very interesting to me because nobody refers to an EDR as antivirus. So I'm like, you weren't running an EDR. What antivirus were you running? Were you like running like Norton or Symantec like on your computers? Like what was actually going on here? You've got no security policies because then they say, you know, the threat factor in terms of what was going on were all these VPN hosts from from international, like Mulvad VPN and like all these different things. You're like, okay, so you've also got no like correlation whatsoever of where your developers are actually authenticating, connecting to your systems. Like, like, and, you know, of course, there's like all these things that you can get unpack and say, well, like this tech solves this problem and this tech solves this problem and this solves that problem. And, but it was wild in the, in the sense that, anyways, I'll send it to you. You have to read it. We'll talk about it later because I'm, I'm really kind of curious about this. So let me add one thing though, real quick on your AWS thing about the please, keys and rotation please. and all that. So what I've seen, and this is something I've seen historically, let's just talk about API keys, right? And I think Ugh. that salt, as the company now has a solution to pretty much solve all of this, um, you know, it's something that I've actually been hearing from a lot of my financial service vendors that they are leveraging Salt to secure and manage API now, which is fine. Most technology, a lot of technology use Salt vault. anyway. Yeah, Hashi Hashi Corp vault. Right. yeah, yeah. There's a bunch of different ones, but one thing that I've noticed about AWS when it comes to these type of incidents are one is they don't get involved, but the second thing is. You will know about the incident because they will just shut your service off. And until you've remediated it, they just don't turn your service back on. Things like S it could be like SMS, you know, someone gets a hold of the API key and starts sending emails out from your platform or something, right? It's probably one of the most common ones. Uh, and and they just don't have the in my opinion, it's not necessarily the right approach if you are looking at it from we're also going to sell security products to our customers. You know, it, the approach they take is like, hey, you come here to host our infrastructure. Behind hosting the infrastructure, the underlying, like, that's your problem, you know. And and yet, but at the same time, they'll come back and sell you products to solve that problem. So it's like, don't you have a little bit of responsibility in the delivery point of all of this infrastructure just to secure the other customers to make sure that somebody couldn't really cross one of these so-called barriers that we all have? You know, and you look at it from that aspect and you're like, if you're selling security products, you should have responsibility to have to then go back in and say to the customers like, or have some type of tool that says, hey, you know, press these buttons like Microsoft does and your score goes up, right? AWS, up to my knowledge, I don't believe they have a tool or something like that. You would probably know better, Max, because you're the expert in, in cloud. But, you know, from my st standpoint, I look at it more as alarming. Like, so you mean to tell me you're just going to suspend me for five days after I just blasted four million emails out to everybody in the world and fish the world? But I only got to be suspended for four days. And if I wait four days to get my account back, you know, like <laughs> there's... there's a better example that I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to pivot to here. All right, cool. Go for it. Microsoft sells an email security package on top of their email that they sell you with Office 365. 
I, you know, I like, I understand going out and getting a proof point, a Mimecast, a dark trace, like any of these email security overlays. And by the way, you know, like when you, when you see like what they do on top of like Google workspace in terms of like detection, like it's unbelievable, but, but I don't understand how Microsoft sells an email security package on top of their email that they've already sold to you. Like it, that, that feels criminal to me. Like there's just a certain point where you're like, <laughs> you know, like. I, I don't, I, you know, uh, I mean, so it's just, it's, it's, I, I mean, in the, like, the whole, like, oh, you're going to sell the EDR, the Defender tool and the Sentinel. It's like, okay, I, I get that. Like, that, that makes sense. That's a completely different functionality package. But like, if I'm already paying you to host my email, like, shouldn't you be doing this for me? I don't know. Maybe I'm crazy. The email piece is interesting. You know, to Microsoft's defense, they probably look at it as, well, we give you some filtering and we tell you sometimes when it's malware. So we gave you something, you know? But you need to pay for a little bit more. I don't know. I've, I'm still trying to figure out the whole new Microsoft model of where we're trying to go. you know. And I'm also trying to figure out how they're like number one in every single security product. <laughs> anyone else ever, anyone ever use Sentinel yet from Microsoft? We, we a little, we're not there yet. Right. Well, you know, but cool that they can integrate with chat GPT now, though. So. You know, might as well just have our analysts use Chat GPT as their standard response. That's classic. So I, um, <laughs> I think what's scary about that for me is the conversation of, oh, we enabled E5 security, so we are now secure. And and I, you know, it, it's a really un I mean, I don't even know where to take that conversation really of like, oh, we've enabled it, so we're secure now. And you're like, no, no, no. No, 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 you're not like, no, this is not how this works. Like, and, and I, I, I worry about the amount of pain that's like coming down the pipe with a lot of these organizations that just have this assumption of like, we turned 95 security and now we're secure. And they're like, no, 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 you licensed a tool that now you need to do something with, you know, in order to see stuff. And, you know, it's just, it's just a tool. Like, like you're not, you know, you're, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean, you, you take a stab at this one, Chris. Like, what do you, what do you, what do you... So, well, I think there's some advantages to, like, E5. I think some oh. one thing I think most people don't know about on the E5, I think you only need, like, one E5 license to get the dashboards to for the rest of the environment. So if you have one, you get the features and functionality across the rest. I just don't know how it works across them. Not Microsoft guy, like, in that way. Um, but my thing is, there's no way they're the best of breed in every one of those products or else there would be no other competition. They own the operating system. And in addition to that, um, I would never throw all my eggs in my basket in, with the company that solely is providing that stack from start to finish, right? Just for the same reason why I think that Apple has really tried to stay out of you know some of these products, right? They deliver you a Mac computer or Apple, you know, iOS on it. Uh, and iOS from there is a pretty secure environment. I mean, organically always has been better than Microsoft, right? Less susceptible. Um, doesn't mean it's not, you're not impacted, right? We're all using Chrome browsers and we're all susceptible to all this other stuff that's in the wild. You know, we all use Microsoft products across the board too, which, you know, brings us all of our chaos. <laughs> you know, ma amazing how malware is always in a WinWord file or an Excel or, you know, and it's always coming through your email. You hit it right on there, there. You know, so, you know, I think the value of an E5 of giving people features and functionality is a good thing. I think Microsoft took the approach of Walmart though and is now offering them everything in one thing. And customers do think that this is a one all get all and I'm gonna do this and I'm gonna do that. Guys, it took us six years to build what they're telling you you can build in a week. It's not possible. It's That's probably the easiest way to say it. It's not possible. You can't take something that took six years and make it in a one week. And and if you did, then I mean, everyone would be out of business, right? But it's not the case. They're, they look at it as I'm just going to get throw more product so I can charge you more money and you know what's E5 now fifty dollars a user almost. I think the list is fifty seven is what it's at. How much fifty seven? Fifty seven, I think is what fifty seven. But we can't get twelve for security, guys. Well, I mean, we in that here? well, what you're going to argue there is you're going to license it for fifty seven, which includes your EDR and your SIM. So maybe you did get your twelve. I mean, the, the just Microsoft got the twelve. You know the power of the bundle is is unbelievable. Like I mean, if you're if you're just talking about like budget allocation of what you're actually going to do, and you and, you know you, you mentioned EAs, like going out and getting an EA, you know, and and just having all this stuff licensed, it's like, well, 
you know, why why don't we run teams and, and put voice in teams and then run Defender and then run Sentinel and like, you know, and there's there's a whole eco. I mean, right? Like you can. I, I've been, geez, man, I've been dealing with Microsoft. I was I'm a Windows NT four four O Exchange five O. I mean, that's how far back like certified like, you know. I was deploying Exchange servers before they had an SMTP connector built into it. Like, I mean, you have an email server that can't send and receive email. Like, <laughs> like think about that one for a second, right? You had to license and install the SMTP connector separate, right? I mean, that's like how old I am at doing this stuff. But, you know, in in 25 years of Exchange, you know, that I've been dealing with it, right? Like, it, never in that span of 25 years would you not have an external backup or or an external spam and antivirus system. And I, I mean, I kind of wonder about that with Defender and Sentinel of like, okay, cool, we've got this thing, but we still need to go out and now buy all this other stuff that runs on top of it in order for the make you know the thing to actually work. Um, you know, what does this do to like a Splunk or what does this do to you know these other companies that are providing the actual tool, right? Like, you know. Uh, you know, CrowdStrike and Sentinel definitely are branded, right? And they're they're market leaders. But you know, you look at these smaller EDR platforms. Did, did these things like go bye bye? Like, what happens? What happens there? And does everything just become Defender? Like, I don't know. You know, that's that's hard to say and predict. I think that if you're drinking the Microsoft Kool Aid and you're an E5 shop or E3 plus ATP, quasi E5, however you want to look at it. I think that there are tools out there. I know there are. For example, I talk. I have this conversation all the time around our, our our EDR that we include inside of our SOC platform, which is a forensic agent. It's it's NetWitness EDR, and NetWitness EDR doesn't do any AV. It doesn't have an antivirus component like a traditional CrowdStrike or anything would. It looks at it more from like a forensic standpoint. Access to MFT file tree, system dumps, response capability, whitelist, blacklist snapshots, all the things that a responder would need on top of that tool, like an E5 license using Microsoft Defender, therefore giving it as much power, horsepower, theoretically, as like a CrowdStrike enterprise with Overwatch or something like that, then effectively managed by our team. So you can get there, but you got to be creative. Whereas, you know, you if you're looking at Microsoft Plus, I just think that the best way to look at these Microsoft is Microsoft Plus something. You know, if I'm going to invest more in, in an E5, that's probably going to save me maybe some email security space. Maybe I might save something. I might get, you know, encryption as part of that. And I was paying for encryption somewhere else. You know, obviously there's, you know, BitLocker and all these other things that come, you know, with disk encryption and stuff that are part of these licenses that are good, you know, wins. They're wins, right? But, you know, for every time you go to Walmart, you still got to go to REI sometimes to go get the specialized, you know, pair of shoes or the bike or whatever it is. Or, you know, Walmart doesn't, you know, repair your bicycle tires, but REI does. Okay. Right. You know, things like that. So I think that's the model. You have to augment what you're doing. Take that spend and throw a little bit extra. Maybe it's 10 to 15 percent on top of your Microsoft spend to bridge the gap and also have layers. Right. I always looked at email security as nobody ever has enough layers. <laughs> Right. Everybody got an email security solution, got email, but nobody thinks about like adding on extra to that. You know, maybe you need two email security. Maybe you need Microsoft E5 plus like Avade secure who for an extra dollar or two will do some classification, do some AI in your box. Huh? Okay. Well, all of a sudden it makes sense, right? And they're just not, it's not Microsoft's trying to be all. And at the same time, they're missing their opportunity where they just integrated with all these companies, leverage them into your stack and show people how to do it. You know, and that, that's kind of my passion on that side of it. But it'll, we'll get there, man. There's enough people that want this stuff to happen that I think we'll get there as a space. But, you know, it's, it's disruptive when the vendors come in and they market the hell out of it and change a customer pers perspective on what norm is, therefore effectively making this customer not as secure in the end, you know, not to say Microsoft doesn't secure you. It absolutely does. But, you know, if you have a perception that every time you walk in your house, there's never an intruder, someday you might get caught for a surprise, you know, <laughs> and, well, and, and that's, you know, kind of where it leaves that, right? 70, 80% of all cyber incidents start from email, you know, whether that's, I mean, whatever the actual, you know, phishing, payload delivery, whatever. And I would imagine that 99% of those companies are running Office 365 or Google Workspace. So, 
you, you know, like it, it's like one of those like just just connect the, the third dot, which is you you know you should absolutely be running something on top of your sure. email because your number one threat vector is I mean it's just email like it just it just really people employees aren't randomly on some website that delivers some payload and installs some RMM agent and team viewer like that doesn't that that it's not like some they had to get to that website somehow right and how do they get to that website well usually they click a link that they weren't you know that like anyways okay let's 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 circle the wagons come all the way back to the beginning here so Let's give it a hypothetical, right? So a hypothetical would be a company that has, um, you know, let's say they've 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 gone out and they've they've, you know, invested in the basics, right? They've got an EDR tool. Maybe they have a sim or they don't. They've got some internal people doing, um, you know, SOC function and and uh, and um, you know event and, you know event correlation and investigation work. You know, they've 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 got maybe they've got an SWG, maybe they don't. But they've they've kind of gotten to that point where they understand like we cannot do this. Like we cannot mm-hmm. scale this. We can't do this efficiently 24 seven or bur- you know, our, our, our employees are expensive, you know, like this is not an efficient use of our salary dollars. Let's go out and let's find an MDR. Let's go out and find a sock service to overlay on top of this. So this company now is going to market and they're, and they're talking to different, you know, what do you do differently and better than the market? That makes um, that makes 360 sock a natural fit and like a place where, like aha, like this is the only company we should be doing business. Number one, you come companies come to 360 sock because they want a hundred percent of white glove experience. Um, most of our most successful customers came from our competitors. Um, they they adopted that you know a security path was the only path. Um, but the ones that come from our competitors always say one thing, and it's. Number one, onboarding is exceptional. It's very hands-on, it's white glove. But in addition, our competitors are charging up, charging for that ongoing continued life cycle of white, of white gloving the experience, whereas we include that in, from start to finish. The coolest thing we do by far, and it's the only, we're the only entity out there in the world offering SOC and MDR, is the live chat function within our security operations center. Um, our customers, 24-7, 365, have a five-minute SLA, SLO to, to get to our analysts um, via chat within our platform and from there can initiate a live conversation. Um, we're the only company out there in the world that does offer that live chat function. That, from what we're told from our customers, has been a game changer. It takes the effectiveness up. It creates a run book at the customer level. It, it, it mitigates escalations, which then at the end of the day, makes us more effective at securing the environment and also monitoring, you know, what we're delivering for those customers. Um, so, yeah. Let's talk about, let's talk about the incident. Yeah. You know, let's talk about the incident chain, right? Because, you know, a company, um, you know, overlays 360 stock on top of this. And, you know, again, we're, I don't think this is technology specific, whether they're still running the SIM or they're run on your platform, right? Let's just, they've, they've Im- implemented your SOC services. So at that point, um, either something happens that they become aware of, or your SOC picks up something and says, this is not okay, right? How, how far into incident response and remediation, like what becomes the checkpoints or these, are these like interactions, the lines between you and, and the customer? I mean, are you unplugging devices off their network for them? Or are you, you know, calling the CEO on his cell phone and being like, oh, rip the cables out of your networking closet? Like, well, like, what does this look like? So for us, we have response built into the platform. So, you know, understanding responsibility in the platform, it gives us a lot of features and functionality to be able to reach out to firewalls, block IPs, URLs, indicators, um, hashes, isolate devices, you know, kill devices, power them down, et cetera. Um, so definitely have, you know, full functionality to respond. Um, you know, as far as like ripping cables and all that, when something happens, you know, you got to understand that. It's never a fire drill like that. For one, if, if service providers are running in a fire drill like that, then they got a big problem on their hands. One, they're not getting anything done and they're not being effective. There, there's a lot that goes into a conversation before you would get to incident response. And I really think that our whole space kind of splits incident response out versus response. We, we as a company provide response all the way down to the eradication level. 
So what that means is that you know if we can if we have access to an endpoint security solution and you have console at you know remote console, if the directory is plain Jane, we know it's not supposed to be there. The file, whatnot, we can blow that away and eradicate for you. In the in the opposite scenario, if we go through all this process, we we're trying to figure out what it is. We're asking questions. You can't figure out what it is. We can't figure out what it is, and we have to move to forensics then that's where incident response comes in and they need to notify their insurance company that and figure out can we do the incident response or do you want you know is that are they is that third party bringing in like a breach coach for example yeah or whatever they call their responders okay so so that's kind of the approach from an escalation standpoint knowing that we have live chat in the platform everything goes through the platform customers a lot of times these escalations they know the answer right away they want to go in the platform they want to respond and they want to hit the close button once they hit the close button, their response goes into the run book. The next time we see that same incident, we know how to respond. We don't have to impact the customer. So our customers do like us because of our effectiveness when it does come to escalations. We run a 0.1% escalation ratio annually, year over year. Basically, what that means is our team is 99.9% .9 effective from start to finish in every investigation year over year. So that so you say point one. So point one of events that you're seeing is what actually ends up being escalated to your customers team. Or a question has to be asked. I, I mean, the amount of noise that that comes sound. Like, I mean, that should probably be your like your lead in of like you know because the amount of noise that, that I mean, this is like my favorite thing. You like you implement an IDS IPS some sort of you know thing, and you say, okay, I found an IT team did this, and I say. Let me see your uh, email folder where you've created auto auto filtering rules and Outlook to like just shove all your IDS alerts into this folder and never look at it again. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> I mean, you know what's bad about it is that's everyone, right? They're like, wait a minute here. You mean to tell me every time I get something assigned to me, it gets it sends me an email? Well, that's getting filed. Like just... you're like, oh god. Oh, so... Yeah, twenty four seven, three sixty five, just. <laughs> The email coming through. <laughs> so you're connected to the internet. What's the first thing that happens? It's like as soon as you plug your your your, your network into the internet, it's like you're getting scanned by everything, right? You're just like, oh, good grief. Um, okay, so that reminds me of a of a very famous and depressing hack. Uh, so Target had an incident many years ago. This is very public, and they ultimately found um, software installed in their point of sale terminals that was skimming credit card numbers straight out of the POS terminal. So you go swipe your credit card. Boom, it was getting packaged up and shut out. So, um, and kudos actually to like releasing like the root cause analysis. And the root cause comes down to an HVAC contractor who had access to their store networks in order to monitor and maintain their HVAC systems. You know, small, you know, perceptionally much smaller than Target, right? Wasn't spending millions of dollars in their cyber. Who knows if they were spending anything on it, right? I mean, they're an HVAC company. Why do we need to have cyber, cyber security, right? So, um, that's not the depressing part for me. The depressing part for me is that Target had a third party monitoring their network and paying attention to what was going on that was alerting Target, that was escalating to Target, this stuff is actually going on and you need to do something about it. And those escalations were being ignored. So let me, let me ask you the uncomfortable question, which is, you know, you have a customer and you know something is seriously wrong going on with that customer. And, you know, Whoever that that escalation path is, is like, hey, you know, it's a company party. I'm not dealing with this stuff. I'm off getting drunk right now, or whatever's going on, or just I just don't feel like responding to this stuff because I'm disgruntled, or I'm, I'm, I'm just I'm I'm overworked, or whatever things are. Like, how do you deal with that as a service provider? And like, what have you had to deal with this? And like, what did you do? So you always have everyone has the customers that don't respond. So what you organically have to do is you just have to do more for them. You have to note that one, if you were going to escalate to them, it's ultra critical. The other thing is that you have to be the first and willing to respond for them, knowing that potentially they might not respond. So if something is ultra critical like that, um, it's malware, it's been executed, we're going to go ahead and put that device right in isolation until we can review that with the customer, try to figure out what that is. Therefore, if it's 3 a.m., they don't have to get woken out of bed. If they're at a company party, they can party it up. We can address it when they get in the office. We will mitigate the exposure. Um, we do that for our customers, and we've also built in um, some unique use cases leveraging combinations of threat intelligence, data deduping, and historical runbooks from the customer itself, and, and actually combine that together looking for 
you know, commonalities or miscommonalities so that we know how to respond as well. So, so I, I ton of, is, tons of different things built in the solution for that. Probably second part that you should have on your website. You know, first thing, well, we escalate nothing to you. And the second thing is, is we'll take care of it when your employees don't, right? Like it's... Uh, you know, and, and I like it's, that. We'll take care of it when your employees don't. I'm, you know? I'm telling you, you know, we'll work for uh, bottles of booze being sent to my house. Um, yeah, <laughs> only the finest bourbon, though. Uh, it's so hard to ship bourbon though in the U.S., right? It's um, get it's even harder and harder. I mean, uh, yeah, harder and harder. There's a couple reserve bar. I think there's. Uh, I'll get you a can out. My our chief compliance officer is a huge bourbon guy, and he found a couple distilleries that got that they'll ship anywhere in the states. So um, I don't know how they would pull so it off. I, I was. I was in Nashville. I went to Jack Daniels because I was like, yeah, I'm in Nashville. Like, I'll go to Jack Daniels. I, I pulled the ultimate rookie mistake of like, I'm going to buy bottles of Jack Daniels. It's like engraved from Jack Daniels for like friends and family and stuff. And then, of course, it's like, no, no, no. You have to put this in your luggage and check the bag. And you're like your bag's like clinking. clinking, <laughs> clinking, 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 clinking. You're like, 300 pounds <laughs> full of Jack. On <laughs> and I just have this moment. I have this like visualization of like this bag coming down the conveyor belt. <laughs> where it's just like seeping out, out of the bag. <laughs> Everyone's like, nightmare coming back from Hawaii for sure, right? There. You can <laughs> ship wine. You cannot ship liquor. And I'm like, why did I? I mean, of course, like I've never, you know, these are the things that like until you try to do the first time, like why would you ever think about it? And I, I, I kind of, I'll, I'll connect that back to security where it's like until you've had an incident, right? The stuff you're like, why should we have this? You know, you know, I think the hard, the hard part is, is, um, there's tech and there's tools that solve almost every problem, you know, like you, maybe you just don't know the Rosetta stone. You don't know how to translate the problem you're trying to solve into technology. You're trying to solve it with, but like almost all this stuff is solved. It's now just, did we implement it in time? You know, like backups are a solved problem. Do we have backups? Do we test our backups? You know, do we have an EDR? Could we do forensics? Could we unwind changes? Could we, do we, you know, uh, ubiquity, right? Ubiquity wired forty million dollars to some bank, you know, because they convinced the controller that they were buying a company that was being that they couldn't release because whatever. And like they're like, oh yeah, sure, forty million dollars. Email, email based threat, uh, and forty million dollars goes out, you know, and and you're like, okay, great, you know, what do you, what do you do here? And you're like, well, you know, there's actually turns out there's tech that'll help you prevent this from happening to you, and then processes, processes, and people. Okay, Chris. We've been at this for a while. What have we not talked about? What, uh, what, 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 uh, I don't want to say like final words here, but like, you know, how do, uh, you know, what, what are next steps? What haven't we talked about? How, you know, like wh where do we go from here? You know, I think the one thing that I'll add is that everything that you think that you should probably just be doing on an annual basis, you know, or on a schedule probably needs to be done more regularly, more often. And also, you know, you need to have people in your back pocket that can help you crunch data, numbers, scenarios. Mm -hmm. And without those teams pre-enabled, you know, you're always going to be chasing. Cybersecurity is not something you want to chase. Cybersecurity is something you want to stay ahead of. And you can significantly stay ahead of it with the right service providers, the right products, the right service, and also, you know, most importantly, educating your front line, which is your employees. And then also making sure that the low hanging fruit stuff like configurations, and all that stuff is not, you know, where you're susceptible to attack, right? Um, you know, to answer your question around, you know, every, you know, there's probably a solution out there for everyone. Yeah, definitely. There's there's tons of solutions out there, but there's still zero days, right? And the combination of zero days and how you, you know, can discover them and also, you know, start mitigating when you discover them does come down to visibility. You know, you mentioned the target attack and... You know, I, I think if I recall in the target attack, how they actually find the activity from those terminals is by using a network detection and response solution, i.e. called packets, won't name the vendor, but uh, happens to be in our stack. And uh, they were actually able to detect the connection events, therefore start the remediation path. Um, you know, if, you, if you're out there doing and looking at things like NDR, these are the use cases that you know, that's why these technologies were developed. It's really hard to see in real time what's going on. But if you have the right tools in place and the right visibility, those persistent ticks, data movement and all that, you can start seeing this and you can analyze it and break it down and visualize it. So, you know, the one thing I'll add is, you know, you got to stay ahead of it. You got you to invest in learning about it. I'm not saying you got to buy it. 
but you got to educate yourself to understand what what the whole space is about as a company, to understand then what your risk is at an organization. And then if you're in a role where you're a, a responsible for these things, you need to always be educating because this is moving fast. And it's moving faster than the people, and which means that the space is moving to, you know, kind of move people out of it, right? And, and you know, and those are the things I think, and I think customers, the scariest thing to add, and what's good probably on your side of the house is, you know, customers need more assets. They need trusted advisors that understand this stuff. And when I say understand it, they understand the baseline of being able to ask questions and deliver it to an expert so the expert can analyze it, give you information that you can deliver back. The companies, the people like yourself, Max, that have the ability to do that, now is the time and the opportunity is riper than ever because customers are underserved and you guys in, in the partner community and in your seat, Max, you guys have the opportunity to shape their future by educating them. The average tenure of a CISO is like 18 to 20 months right now. And when you, when you think about... Um, the longevity of program, you know, like 18 to 20 months. And, and by the way, CIOs are also in the two year cycle, you know, like, like senior executives in the IT world, you know, really seem to be on a two, you know, it's like this two year cycle mark is pretty common. And, and it's actually not even senior executives, that's senior engineers, like the two year cycle is, is, is you know, comes all the way down. It, it's almost, it feels like to me at a certain degree that like the most valuable contribution that a person can give to you as a company, if they're going to be on this two year, like a CISO, like the most valuable thing a CISO can do for a company in 18 months is establish program and vendor relationships that are going to last three, five, seven years, because then at least there's a longevity of engagement where, you know, this was implemented. This is why, and I mean, just being, it's crazy to think about it. Like, like you know, from like a knowledge standpoint of being able to say like, this is what happened four years ago and what we did as a result of it. Like if you don't, ha you, you know, like you, you can't assume that you're going to have that sort of knowledge base inside the company anymore with people that were available, but yet who does the, the people that do are your third part, your MSPs that you've actually engaged that can, that can run with you for, you know, a long span of time and actually provide that, you know, continuity along the way. So, so I think I, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I, I, I'm a, when you think like build versus buy, you know, historically my brain always goes to build. Like I, I'm an engineer. I love building, but the value in building is so greatly diminished now that being able to actually buy and implement and manage, it's just, you know, it just feels like it's a no brainer for me to go that direction. Anyways. Yep. I will get off my soapbox. Um, Chris. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Mac. Look forward to playing some more golf with you this year, man. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, getting some <laughs> other stuff going. So thank you for the opportunity. We, on behalf of my whole company, appreciate it. Thank you for thinking of us. And, uh, you know, definitely thanks for being, you know, a true trusted advisor out there in the space because, I mean, again, couldn't reiterate enough. This is what customers need. This is what customers need in their back pocket. And trusted advisors outlive employees at these companies. So, you know, if you want to be resilient and not worried about, you know, that two year life cycle, this is, this is a solution for that. And conversations like this definitely enable them. So thanks for, you know, including us on this, Max, we appreciate it. Yeah. I mean, Chris, I'll, I'll end on this. Like it's easy. If you're a, if you're a big company, you're fortune 100 and you say, okay, we want to go out and solve a solution. Let's go get another fortune 100 to solve this problem for us. You can find those programs and we have them and we deal with them and, and we like them. Right. But that's not a good fit for everybody. And, and, and you, you talk about like white glove and an onboarding, the bigger you get when you say, you know, I won't, I won't abuse anybody's names here, but the bigger you get, the more regimented your process has to be. And the more a customer has to conform to your process in order to be able to actually go through end to end in your process. And I really like, I don't want to say it like the smaller companies, but I really like the companies that are still being able to provide like one-off individualized that you know because as much as everything is the same it's that little that like five percent of difference that makes a huge you know that's that's everything in the world so yeah so yeah big fan all right thanks chris